Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. Uh, we do ask everyone as we prepare to begin to check that cell phones have been turned off as a courtesy to our presenters and those recording the events today. We, of course, welcome internet questions at any time. Our internet viewers are welcome to send their comments or questions to speaker at heritage.org. And, of course, we will post the program on the Heritage homepage for your future <coughs> reference. Opening our discussion today and hosting our program is Paul Larkin, who serves as a senior legal research fellow in our Edwin Meese III Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. He directs our over-criminalization project to counter the abuse of the criminal law, particularly at the federal level. From 1994 to 93, he was at the Department of Justice serving as an assistant to the Solicitor General and as an attorney in the Criminal Division Section on Organized Crime and Racketeering. He even argued 27 cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. He then served as counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee and head of the Crime Unit for Senator Orrin Hatch. From two, 1998 to 2004, he worked at the Environmental Protection Agency as a special agent for criminal enforcement. Please join me in welcoming Paul Larkin. Paul. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone here. Thank you, everyone who's watching on TV or over the Internet. We're pleased to be able to present this program today because it involves some very important issues, and we have some very distinguished panelists. Let me say that for some time now, society has been bedeviled by three problems, alcohol abuse, illicit drug use, and crime. The intersection of each of those problems magnifies the adverse effect of each one. But state and local officials in South Dakota and Hawaii have found some creative ways to try to address those problems through two very innovative programs, 24-7 sobriety and Hawaii's Opportunity Probation with Enforcement, also known as HOPE. Those programs seek to achieve three rather elusive goals in the criminal justice system, to reduce incarceration, to reduce recidivism, and to reduce substance abuse. To reduce incarceration, the programs place offenders on probation. To reduce recidivism and substance abuse, they rigorously and frequently drug test for alcohol or other illicit, or illicit substances in order to determine whether or not people have stayed sober and clean. Both programs have proved very successful in achieving the goals they set out for themselves. And in the meantime, both programs have also proved very cost efficient. These creative programs deserve our careful consideration because they are reasonable and humane ways of addressing several of the problems that our criminal justice system faces. And I am very fortunate to say we have three experts on these type of programs here. First, and immediately to my left, is the Honorable Larry Long. Judge Long is a native of the Mount Rushmore State. He graduated from South Dakota State University and the University of South Dakota Law School. From 1973 through 1990, he was a Bennett County State's Attorney and prosecuted hundreds of felony cases. From 91 through 2002, he served as the Chief Deputy Attorney General for South Dakota and in 2002 was elected the South Dakota Attorney General. Since September 2009, he has served as a circuit judge in the Second Judicial Circuit. Judge Long created the 24-7 sobriety program that you will hear about today. It is a zero-tolerance program for alcohol-abusing offenders that gives them a chance to dry out and walk right without going to prison. The program has been recognized as being effective, efficient, and humane. In 2008, the Council of State Governments saw the merit in the program by awarding it an Innovations Award. The Institute for Behavior and Health awarded it the John P. McGovern Award in 2009. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration gave it the Lifesavers Award in 2010, and the Justice Department gave Judge Long an Innovation and Improvement Award in 2013. To his left is the Honorable Stephen Ahm, Judge Ahm is also a former prosecutor, and now this is a judge in Hawaii. From 1994 to 2001, he was the United States Attorney for the District of Hawaii. He took the bench in 2001 and has been a circuit judge in Honolulu ever since. In that capacity, he established the HOPE program 
as means of using probation, aggressive drug testing, and the, imp the imposition of certain swift but moderate punishments as a means of deterring illegal drug use and crime. He runs both the HOPE and the Adult Drug Court programs for H Hawaii. Like the 24-7 sobriety program, Judge Alm's HOPE program has received numerous awards. In 2007, HOPE received the American Judicature Society's Special Merit Citation. In January 2009, Judge Alm received the McGovern Award presented by the Institute for Behavior and Health for the most promising drug policy idea of the year. In 2013, the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University named HOPE as one of the top 25 innovations in government. In fact, just this month, Judge Alm received an award and is here now only after receiving that and we'll be able to tell you about that and his program. To Judge Alm's left is Dr. Robert L. DuPont, a graduate of the Harvard Medical School who completed his residency in psychiatry at Harvard and at the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Ru uh, DuPont was the Director of Community Services for the District of Columbia Department of Corrections. From 1970 to 73, he served as the founder and administrator of the DC Narcotics Treatment Administration. In 73, he became the first director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse and the second White House Drug Chief, a position now known as the Drug Czar. Dr. DuPont left the government in 1978 to found the Institute for Behavior and Health, a nonprofit research and policy development organization devoted to the reduction of illegal drug use. Dr. DuPont is also a clinical professor of psychiatry at the Georgetown University School of Medicine and vice president of Bensinger DuPont and Associates, a leading national employee assistance provider. He has devoted his career to an analysis of the link between addiction and corrections and to the creation of opportunities to reduce drug and alcohol abuse, recidivism, and incarceration. Please join me in giving them uh, a, a hand as well as listening to what each of them has to say because each one will talk about very important public policies and how we can deal with them. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Larry Long. In South Dakota, the criminal justice system is fueled by alcohol and by repeat offenders. From fiscal year 1999 through fiscal year 2010, 37% of all <coughs> felony convictions in my state were drunk driving. A felony drunk driver in South Dakota has accumulated at least three DUI convictions within a 10-year period. That defendant has been through the criminal justice system at least twice and been convicted of drunk driving before he gets his third offense and makes it to a felony level. That defendant is a repeat offender by any measure. After I was elected Attorney General and took office in 2003, the governor asked me to serve a, on a work group to tackle South Dakota's increasing prison population. I dusted off and proposed an alcohol testing program I had used nearly 20 years previously in Bennett County, which was my home and where I was the state's attorney for nearly 18 years. That proposal became the 24-7 Sobriety Project. The original goal of the 24-7 Sobriety Project was to keep the defendant sober 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And as we started experimenting and piloting the program, our target group was repeat DUI offenders. And that was anybody who was arrested for DUI who had a prior conviction within the previous 10 years. The tools that we used for that experiment, for that pilot, were the conditions of pretrial release, or what lawyers refer to as bond conditions. And there were five of them. First of all, the defendant was told you cannot consume alcohol at any time, any place, under any circumstances. Secondly, you can't go in a bar, and by a bar we define that as any place where alcohol 
was available for purchase and consumption on the premises. The third condition was that you will show up at the sheriff's office every morning at 7 o'clock and again every evening at 7 o'clock and you'll take the breath tests so we can verify that you are complying with condition number one. And the fourth condition was if you skip or fail, you will go to jail. And the fifth condition then was you will be released the next day, we will put you back in the system and you will start over. The design of this system was to operate like an electric fence. How many of you, a show of hands, have touched an electric fence? <laughs> how, okay, how many of you have touched it a second time? <laughs> okay, it's not more compli it is not more complicated than that. Okay, well, so we started down the process of putting this program together. Uh, and we immediately ran into some issues. The first issue is South Dakota is a very rural state and, uh, and some of our people who were testing twice a day lived more than 30 <coughs> miles from the test site. Uh, and that required them to travel 60 miles twice a day in order to comply with the test requirements and that was a problem. So what we did was we adopted a tool and that tool is the AMS scram bracelet, which is a bracelet you wear on your leg, and it uh, gathers the emissions from your sweat glands and it tests them for the presence of alcohol on an hourly basis. Uh, and that allowed these people to be tested as part of the program and not have to travel. Uh, the, second program, the second problem we discovered was that many of the participants were switching from alcohol to some other drug in order to maintain their high or, or whatever, deal with their issue, but yet be able to pass the alcohol tests. And so then we implemented a urinalysis testing program as a supplement to our alcohol testing program. Those people had to test about twice a week, uh, but that also identified a third problem. And the third problem was some of South Dakota's uh, in fact, many of South Dakota's counties are very small, and uh, often the sheriff's office only has one full-time sheriff and maybe one or two part-time staff, and so uh, your analysis requires uh, more staff than that, and so we also adopted the drug patch, or the feds use this patch regularly, and it has been, uh, it's, uh, federal probation uses it a lot. In any event, so we adopted the drug patch also into our arsenal of tools to run our program. And we were successful enough in our pilot that by 2007, the, uh, the South Dakota legislature had approved our program and authorized it for use statewide. As it stands now in South Dakota, the 24-7 sobriety project is available for all crimes, not just drunk driving, and of course that represents and reflects the reality that there are lots of crimes that are alcohol related that have nothing to do with drunk driving. But yet those people uh, are good candidates for our system. The, the program is available at pretrial or bond level. It is also available for judges to use at post conviction uh, as a condition of a suspended sentence. And it is also available to the parole board uh, so that the parole board can release individuals uh, under supervised release for alcohol and drug use uh, as a condition of being discharged from the penitentiary. Now, the question then is, are we doing any good? And I'll call your attention then to the first slide. It may be a little difficult to read, but We've been doing twice a day testing in South Dakota since February 1st of 2005. To date, there have been over 34,000 participants in South Dakota. They have been tested 7.1 million times. Uh, and the passing rate for that group is 99.2%. What that means is for every 100 tests that are performed, over 99 times the person shows up on time and blows a clean test. Uh, our urinalysis was implemented in July of 2007. There have been over 4,000 participants there. Those people are tested on an average about twice a week. 
and that passing rate is 96 percent. The drug patch is not used widely, but we have had 265 participants, over 2,600 tests have been administered, and that passing rate is 82 percent. Now, I should have another slide. All right. These two stats are for the SCRAM bracelet and for an ignition interlock that we have recently implemented into our system. Uh, we, put a, we put the SCRAM bracelet into effect in October of 2006. To date, there have been nearly 7,000 people in South Dakota who have worn the SCRAM bracelet, and they have worn that for slightly over one million days. Uh, the individuals there uh, have been fully compliant. And the 77 percent stat is, I think, the one most significant. Those individuals, of the, of the nearly 7,000 individuals, 77 percent of those people have been fully compliant. In other words, for the time that they wore the bracelet, they have had no tampers and no confirmed drinking events. The ignition interlock is a device that we have just recently put in. Uh, there's a mistake in my slide. It says October 10th of 2014. That's a little premature. It was actually put in effect on October 10th of 2012. To date, there have been 276 participants, and we have a, we have a, a success rate there of 95 percent. So in the short term, I think we've done some good. In the long term, I think we've done some good as well. We have done some recidivism testing within our own data to determine how we've done. And by recidivism, we identified or defined recidivism as the length of time from the completion of the 24-7 sobriety program to the next arrest for DUI. Uh, and we were, we were the, and the participants in this recidivism are individuals who are, were convicted of second, third, or fourth offense DUIs. And at all levels, for all participants, uh, there was at least a 50 percent reduction in the re-arrest rate for participants of the 24-7 program. So at one year, at two years, and at three years, each individual who participated in 24-7, irrespective of their length of time in the program, uh, were 50 percent less likely to have been re-arrested for DUI. Now, my favorite slide, though, is this one. These are alcohol-related traffic fatalities in South Dakota from the years 2000 through 2013 inclusive. Uh, now, if you look at the charts, the, the bars in red represent 2000 through 2004, which is the five years before we implemented the 24-7 program. The average death rate annually there was 83. In the nine years from 2005 through 2013 inclusive, that rate has dropped to 55.3. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. We all wear our seatbelts better than we used to. We all drive safer cars than we used to. I'm sure there are other factors, but I think the 24-7 program is part of that equation. We test 2,200 people a day for alcohol consumption, and I am confident that that has an effect in terms of the reduced traffic deaths in South Dakota. So, thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Steve Alm, a uh, judge in Honolulu. I was a career prosecutor, and Hawaii's got to be the only state where the path to the bench typically is through the defense bar. So I was the first career prosecutor to be appointed to the circuit court bench. So I ate lunch alone a lot at first. Uh, <laughs> but I was the last case of the prosecutor's office is the murder of a police officer. Then I was the United States attorney from 94 to 2001. I bring that up because. Starting something like hope is a challenge. Doing things differently. And being a career prosecutor gave me the credibility to do it. Um, felony probation, we had about 8,000 people on felony probation on Oahu. Uh, lots of problems 
we have good POs, we have caring judges, it's the system itself is broken. And this is similar across the country. At sentencing, a judge will read all these conditions of probation, and probation is the alternative to prison at sentencing, community supervision for four or five years. But the judge will say, no alcohol, no drugs, see your PO, pay your restitution. The problem is some people will do fine on that. Many people will fail at that. When they fail, the problem is the PO has two choices, the probation officer. Work with the person, encourage them, threaten them, cajole them. You, un you tested dirty for methamphetamine, our biggest uh, illegal drug. You understand that's a violation of probation, yes. If this keeps up next year, you might go back to court and get five years in prison. Don't worry, I'll stop. But the person leaves the probation office, understanding this is not a serious system, you know, I'm going to keep getting high and I'm going to keep doing it until something stops me. And they know it's going to be a year or two before anything happens. Because the probation officer's choice is either talking to them or writing up the violations, coming back to court and asking me to give them the five or ten years in prison. So it's all or nothing. Some judge famously once said you can either at sentencing send them to prison or send them to the beach. And this is not a knock on probation officers. They just do not have a tool to do anything quickly. So the first week on this felony trial calendar in June of 04, I looked at this, motions to revoke probation with 20 violations. Finally, the PO had given up, spent a couple of hours documenting all the violations, got the person arrested, brought them back, and recommended to me every time, send them to prison for five or 10 years. They're not amenable to probation. And I thought, what a crazy way to try to change anybody's behavior. And I thought to myself, OK, this doesn't work. What would work? And I thought about how my wife and I had raised our son. How were we raised? Your parents tell you what the family rules are. And then if there's misbehavior, something happens immediately. It doesn't have to be severe, but it has to be swift. It has to be certain. Then you and your kids learn to tie together bad behavior with a consequence and learn from it. So that was the simple idea behind all this. So in the future, uh, this is June of 04, we kicked off the program in October of 04 with the idea that if they come in and test positive for drugs and admit it, they get arrested on the spot. They go to jail. We have a hearing two days later, prosecutor, public defender. And I'll probably let them out because they came to the courthouse knowing they had messed up. They have to call a random drug test hotline. They're given a color for privacy purposes. So every weekday morning, they have to call this hotline. If their color's listed, they have to come in and get drug tested. So their color's going to come up once or twice a week. Uh, drug courts are a whole separate conversation. Drug courts are great. They can be very effective with whatever population they're working with. Uh, but drug courts often deal with a, a pretrial population, a lower risk population. We have now shifted our drug court to a high risk population. But in drug court, you see them every week. It's a status conference. You're seeing how they're doing. In hope, I only see them when they violate. And so I am able to supervise a large number of people. This program started in October 1st of 04 with 34 offenders. I told them at the first hearing, everybody in this room wants you to succeed on probation. Your attorney does, the prosecutor does, I do. The taxpayers of Hawaii want you to succeed. It's $45,000 a year to lock you up in prison. Whether you get there or in prison for years is up to you. I, you control yourself. My guess is unless somebody put a gun to your head, nobody can make you do anything you don't want to do, right? They said, yeah. And so I said, but I can control what I'm going to do. And that means in the future, you are likely to go to prison if there are any violations of probation. You're likely to go to jail if there are any violations of probation. And so uh, you can look at hopeprobation.org. A bunch of docs started a nonprofit to explain, you know, show videos and explain this better. But I told them, we want you to be successful. So if you violate, we're all human beings, we can make mistakes. If you violate, but you admit to it right away and you deal with it right away, the jail sanction will be very short, two or three days. If you don't show up at all and the law enforcement folks have to look for you, it's going to be at least 30 days. So you're an adult, you're going to make your own choices. Law schools across the country talk about procedural justice. It usually doesn't happen. The, the criminal justice system is really not set up for that. And the more severe the consequences are, the more due process there's going to be, the longer it takes anything to happen. So hope probation is swift, certain, consistent, and proportionate. And we are convinced one of the chief reasons it works is we are treating people fairly. We're treating them like adults. And so I thought at the beginning it just made sense. Let's target the toughest population. Hope is not a, it's not a boutique court. It's a strategy to do probation. 
So we started with 34 offenders, and let's, we said, let's get the people most likely to fail or the one we want to watch the closest. So sex offenders, domestic violence offenders, people that have, have histories of drug use, that's who we want to focus on. We don't exclude anybody from the program. If they're violent, that's fine. We want the probation officers to refer us to toughest cases, and that's what we do. And so we focused on the highest risk to begin with, 34 people. We started with no extra funding. We just asked everybody to work smarter and harder. Because I was the federal prosecutor, I got the U.S. Marshal to use his fugitive task force to serve warrants for this program. Because I told him, you don't show up for a drug test, I'm going to issue a warrant. And then when you get arrested, you're going to do 30 days in jail. If you show up and admit to it, you get a few days. We're trying to shape behavior. Some of these folks are knuckleheads. It takes const, you know, go to jail every violation. And let's be clear, the truly violent and dangerous, the ones who won't stop stealing, should be sent to prison at sentencing. No probation system is an alternative to that. And I was the toughest senator in the building, the most consecutive sentences. So I had that credibility to start with this. But when there are, and that, but that's a minority, probably 25, 30% of people should get sent to prison at sentencing. But that means 70% should be supervised in the community. And if you do that right, you can save taxpayer dollars, you can help offenders and their families avoid going to prison, and you can reduce crime. So that's what we did. And we started with 34 offenders. We went to the legislature 18 months later. They gave us $1.2 million. And by then, we had our statistics from the attorney general showing uh, people on this program were testing positive, 80% less often. They were missing appointments, same thing. We thought intuitively, got to lead to other better results. When they gave us the money, we used most of it for drug treatment. And uh, there's an old joke in court, an expert witness is a guy from out of town with a briefcase. So our attorney general's office can keep statistics. But a couple of years later, Dr. Angela Hawkin got a grant from the National Institute of Justice and the Smith Richardson Foundation to do a randomized control trial study identified 500 people in main branch probation with drug problems. Two-thirds got put into this program, HOPE. The other third were left on probation as usual. Now, it, it had a name by then. I had a contest among the POs and court staff. We had a lot of entries. One of the early ones was Yank and Spank, <laughs> head of the sex crimes unit. My 15-year-old son said, fail in jail. Accurate, but not aspirational enough. So somebody suggested <laughs> Hawaii's Opportunity Probation with Enforcement. I thought that's great, good acronym. So Dr. Hawkin did this study, three quarters men, violent crime, property crime, drug crime, uh, 16 to 17 prior arrests. A year later, she looked at the results. And uh, uh, half as likely to be arrested for a new crime, half as likely to get revoked, 72% less po fewer positive drug tests. Biggest number is half as many people were sent to prison for years. That is a system that is clear, it's transparent, it lays it all out. One of the fascinating things we've discovered about this program is most people can stop using drugs without going to treatment. If they know they're, and this is, Judge Long has found the same thing in uh, South Dakota, that people can stop drinking without going to treatment. If they know, and drugs are alcohol for us. If they know there's going to be a consequence every single time, most people will make the decision not to use. And if so, that saves the tr precious treatment beds or slots for the people that can't stop on their own. So our treatment programs love this. This is a chart that Dr. Hawkin did. So remember, the study group was 340 people in the HOPE study group. Of that 300, and they were identified because they were active drug users, current drug users. 60% of the tests were for meth. 51% of that 340 did not have a single positive drug test the first year. Another 28% had one. And most of these folks are not in treatment. So if they want to go to treatment, we'll use our money. We get a million two from the legislature, we use most of it for treatment. If they want to go to treatment, we'll help them fund. But if they think they can stop on their own, I give them a chance to show us that and let them do that. That means showing up and testing clean. If they can do that, they don't have to get a reference, they don't have to get an assessment, and they don't have to go to treatment. If they stop, if they use a couple of times, then I'm going to say, hey, it looks like you're having trouble, right? Use jail, use jail for a few days. Then they say, yeah, i got to go to treatment. Then they go to treatment. They're going to be more honest in their assessment about how often they use and the last time they use. And then when they're in treatment, they're going to persevere because they know they're going to get arrested if they leave. When people hear about HOPE, they think, wow, that's a program of jail. Well, jail is a part of it. But if you have a system set up well, you don't have to use it as much. 
So the offenders know this because, and the sanction, basic sanctions are a few days if you admit it, if you deny it and we have to send it out to the lab, you're either in denial or you're wasting everybody's time, you're gonna get 15 days. You don't show up at all, it's 30 days. Some people are gonna fail at hope and go to prison. The good news is many are gonna be successful. Change is really hard. So this is not easy. It's spreading across the country. There are now 18 states, about 60 courtrooms doing hope. Washington State has put its entire high risk, now 17,000 people, into their version of hope, parolees and probationers. And so it's one of those situations that uh, drug testing is hugely important. It's part of it. We have our drug testers come in at 6.30 in the morning. Anybody who wants a drug test before going to work can get drug tested. But these are males watching males, females watching females. We had one young lady, she taped a vial to her rear end. She tried to substitute it in the test. She got caught, of course. So I gave her 30 days in jail. But I told her, you know, miss, you're going to have to find some new friends because that other sample was dirty too. <laughs> so what can you do? <laughs> anyway, because I only see them when they violate, I currently supervise about 1,900 felons in the program. There are people, 7,000, every sex offender on Oahu, if they're not in prison and they're put on probation, they're in hope. They don't all have drug problems, but we want them going to their sex offender treatment. We want them staying away from victims. We want them following through geographically and otherwise. So I'm thrilled to be here. I look forward to any questions. Uh, and when you have a system that reduces victimization and crime, it helps offenders and their families, and it saves taxpayers millions of dollars, it's like this is what we're in the business for. Thank you very much. I'm Bob Dupont, and I'm just very, very pleased to be here. And let me start by thanking Paul Larkin, who's made this possible in Heritage. Uh, this is a, a tremendous opportunity to present some very exciting ideas, and I'm very grateful to Paul uh, and to Heritage for, for making this possible. I began my career 46 years ago, right a few blocks from here. After I had finished, Paul was saying, at uh, Harvard Medical School and the National Institutes of Health, uh, I uh, decided I wanted to commit my career to helping people in prison uh, because I had worked with them in my residency and I cared about those people, and I was very interested in doing what I could to help, so I went to work, as he said, for the D.C. Department of Corrections, head office is a few blocks from here. Uh, and in that context, uh, I discovered the relationship between heroin addiction and crime in the city and became quite involved in drug abuse treatment, and as Paul said, it's been quite a ride since then. But I have kept my focus on the concern that I had 46 years ago. And I want to tell you what we're talking about today is the best new idea in 46 years that I have seen. This is history. This is very important what we're talking about. This is not just another clever idea. This is something scalable and profoundly important. Uh, and I want to talk some more about that. But I want to talk about innovation. And so you can think a little bit about what you're seeing, what you're hearing. Uh, I said to Paul and Larry, uh, to, to, to uh, Steve and Larry, uh, that if, they, they didn't know any experts in the field when they did this. Did you, I don't know whether you listened to that. They came from an experience working with the offenders without expertise, both of them. And I said to them, thank God you didn't know any experts like me, <laughs> because you never would have done this, never. I would not have advised this. I wouldn't have thought of it. And neither would any of the other experts. We can show that because it didn't happen. It came up from their experience. They had a problem, and they had new ideas about what to do with it. So that's one lesson. But the second lesson I want to give you is maybe even more important, because lots of people have good ideas. What you're looking at is two men who have devoted their lives for a decade to the development of this idea and spreading it. That, that, the charisma that they have, the ideas that they have, the determination, the ability to get whole institutions involved in it is very precious. And what we have here today is two people who have come up with this new idea and have devoted themselves to it 
and coming here today to talk about it. So I am very pleased. Now, I left, when I left the government, was, was founded with my wife, the Institute for Behavior and Health. Our job is to find new ideas that will reduce drug use and the problems related to drug use. This is our number one priority. That's how important it is uh, to me and to us. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about what it is that makes this special because it, it may not be so obvious to you. Uh, one thing is the focus on drugs and alcohol is the absolute commitment to no use. That's rare. People talk about that. Most treatment program, drug treatment programs in the country have continued drug use routinely in the treatment programs. The idea that you would set that up as a standard and have consequences for it right away, that's unusual. But that's what this is. So that's one thing that's important. Another is the use of technology, the, the drug testing. Uh, they're talking about uh, the, the use of a, of a rapidly developed technology to identify drug use and integrating that within what they're doing. That also is, is very striking in terms of this. What, what the most stunning, though, is the concept that drug addicts and alcoholics can change their behavior, can stop use with immediate consequences that are predictable with or without treatment. No expert would say that, would have thought that. But they have demonstrated that it is true. And with respect to the treatment, one of the things that I'm, a, I'm I guess, could say I'm an expert at treatment, at least I have a lot of experience with it, the most likely thing when you refer a drug addict or an alcoholic to treatment is that he doesn't go. And if he does go, the most likely thing he's going to drop out. And if he does finish it, the most likely thing he's going to relapse. That is the reality. Now, what they're doing is making treatment work. I've been to see the people who are go to treatment from these programs, and the treatment people love them because they go there. They finish the programs. They don't use. They listen. Why is that? Because of the context. What they have put together makes an entirely different kind uh, of experience. So this swift, certain, moderate kind of sanctions makes a tremendous difference in the behavior, and it sets a model that is very important. Now, I'm going to end with a, with a uh, I started off about the criminal justice system. And my commitment to that, especially around the drug and alcohol use. But I want to shift. I've called this the new paradigm. And, and it's not just its treatment. It's the managing of the care of the substance user. And there is another example that we at IBH have been studying of this model in an entirely different patient population. And that is the nation's physicians. Can you think of a group demographically more different than felons, convicted felons, than practicing physicians? Many of whom, I guess, are felons too, but that's another story. <laughs> but in any event, what happens to physicians in this country when they have a drug or alcohol problem? They go into a state program in all the states that involves mandatory, random testing for five years. Any use, any use of alcohol or drugs in the five years, and they're taken out of their practice. Any use for five years, all of them. And that has set the standard for good long-term outcomes. In a five-year study, we found 78% of the doctors with random testing, every day they have to check just the way uh, Steve was talking about, whether they have to go in, 78% had not a single positive test for alcohol or drugs. Of the 22% who had any positive test, two-thirds never had a second positive test. These are drug addicts and alcoholic physicians. That is stunning, and that says something important about how to deal with this problem. But anyway, I always want to say, again, how proud I am to be here with Heritage how grateful I am for the leadership of, of these two men and how excited I am for the potential within the criminal justice system, these five million people on probation and parole. This is a scalable, affordable idea 
we're talking about. And that is very exciting. Thank you. Before I ask any questions of the panel, I, I want to give Judge Long and Judge Om an opportunity to uh, say anything they want about what anyone else has said. I'll pass. Okay, well, uh, Dr. DuPont has been a great supporter of this in the beginning, just like Pew, just like ONDCP, just like NIJ. And practitioners in the field get this. They know what they're doing doesn't work. And when they hear about something that seems logical, they get into it right away. So. Uh, Judge Long and I didn't know about each other. There are a lot of similarities to the program. So I was thrilled at that. I'm trying to work with the folks at home to get 24-7 started. He's working, in, of course, in South Dakota to get home started. And he started a program with juveniles, which is really exciting to me. So, Let me ask uh, Judge Long and, and Judge Om, um, what would you say in response to someone who would <coughs> claim that this program is being soft on crime, that the better way of dealing with these people is just sending them automatically to prison? How do you respond to that? Well, I, my experience with the public is the public is not particularly offended by people out on probation. What they are offended by is people out on probation that they perceive are not being supervised and are not being held accountable. And my program holds them accountable and uh, the feedback I get, at least from the families, is, you know, I've, every time I've spoken about hope, or uh, about hope, uh, about 24-7, uh, family members come up to me and they say, gosh, Larry, I wish that program had been around when my husband was drinking, or my dad, or my brother, or my son, or it's some variation of you saved my child's life. And... And so I've never apologized to anybody for the way we've structured this program. And we trade jail time for sobriety. And I think that's a fair trade. If uh, they can elect to drink, and we'll put them in jail. If they elect to not drink, we'll let them go home. And everybody wins. Well, and this has been a, uh, uh, a program to try to reduce crime, reduce substance abuse. So it's not a, a right or a left kind of a thing. I think actually, so we've never tried to court political parties. I think actually nationally the Republicans, the conservatives have an easier time embracing it, like the right on crime group, you know, Pat Nolan and others, because they've been seen as tough on crime, so they can be a little more creative. If people don't understand the system, this sounds like it's soft on crime. You test positive for drugs, you get three days in jail or two days in jail. What they don't realize is in a normal probation system or parole system, there is no consequence. So when people, you know, who know the system, they instantly get it. This is, not only is it a consequence, but it's a consequence every single time. And so people are going to learn from it. So it really is harder than probation as usual or parole as usual. But, you know, the public doesn't know anything about any of this stuff. But as Judge Long says, they want results, they want consequences. And so when they hear about this, they're all in favor of it. Could I say something, Paul, about that? Certainly. Uh, they, they, one of the problems within the criminal justice system is concern about this aggressive testing. It's going to fill the prisons. It's going to fill the jails. The biggest sales problem that these two gentlemen had was this aggressive testing. The people in the criminal justice system say, we have so many failures now, you're going to triple our failure rate. And the interesting and important finding is exactly the opposite happened because of the change of behavior that goes on. Dr. DuPont, let me ask you a question. Um, there's a concern that in many of the state criminal justice systems, the system itself has become the mental health system of last resort. How do you deal with that problem if and where it's true by using this program? And can it be used for in that sort of circumstance, or is it not usable in that circumstance? Okay, I, I, I think you know I, I am a psychiatrist. I, I am committed to mental health. I have a practice of my own. I am concerned also about mental illness and its treatment. One of the biggest problems with the seriously mentally ill in the country is just like with the drug addicts, it's compliance with, the pro with treatment, which is a huge problem. And what I, I use the term therapeutic jurisprudence, what I'm interested in is using the criminal justice system to achieve health outcomes 
for people who you can't do that with without the criminal justice system. In other words, that leverage makes a difference in compliance with treatment and taking the medicine and all the rest of it. So I see this as a model, a positive model for mental health in the criminal justice system also. And I would like to see that be developed much more actively. This is the way to go, and it'll work just as well with mental health issues as it does with substance abuse issues. And the, and the, the way this translates in court is, Mr. So-and-so, you may have a chemical imbalance, some other issue. If a mental health professional wants you to take your meds, understand this isn't Burger King. We don't do this your way. You're not in prison. You're on probation. That means you're going to have to follow rules. Part of those rules is taking your meds. You don't take your meds, I will put you in jail. And they'll, then they'll take their meds, be more medication compliant, everything else in their life goes better. For the, the ones, the most severe mental health issues, that is a real problem for people to deal with. No program is perfect. It's just that when you, what we look at is hope 24-7. Are they better than the current system? Do they work better? And I'm convinced they do. And the defense attorneys, dual diagnosis clients, say this is the best thing. It's clear. The consequences are clear. They're much more likely to be medication compliant. And to see the therapist, too. Yep. Let me ask a question for the whole panel. Can these programs be replicated in other states? Or is there something peculiar about South Dakota and Hawaii that allowed them to work there? If you think they can be re replicated elsewhere, how would it be done? Well, 24-7 uh, is operational in South Dakota, it's operational in North Dakota, and it's operational in Montana. Uh, there are pilot projects that are currently in various stages of development in, I think, 10 or 12 other states. Uh, there's a pilot project going on in London, interestingly enough. Uh, I've been trying to get a free plane ticket to go to London. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been able to pull that off yet, uh, but I'm still trying. Uh, I, the, uh, I've had this discussion with some of the folks from NHTSA several times, and, uh, and there is a concern that South Dakota is a rural program because it, it works in South Dakota, it works in North Dakota, it works in Montana, which are large rural states. But uh, my advice to anybody is pick a city and try it. Uh, start small, pick a, pick a small area in a big city and see if you can make it work. There will be problems that you will run into that I haven't thought about. Uh, if you simply run into the problems and decide you're going to fix them, then it'll work. Uh, that's how we started the 24-7 program. We knew there were going to be problems. We just couldn't anticipate what they were. We just simply dealt with them as they came up. And uh, we found a scram bracelet, which plugged a hole. We found a drug patch, which plugged a hole. Uh, you know, you can deal with them if you are committed to get the system and make it work. Uh, but uh, that's, that's, my that's the philosophy we started with, and that works. And I would echo that. It, like anything else in life, where there's a will, there's a way. And so the challenge with this is some places think, oh, we're already doing that. And when you talk to them some more, it's like, okay, you are. Okay, when is an expedited hearing in your jurisdiction? Oh, in two weeks. Is the person in custody? No. You're not doing this. It's got to be on the spot. That's how you tie together behavior with a consequence. But I would echo, start small, get all the moving parts in place, call us. <laughs> You know, I travel once or twice a month on somebody else's dime to explain this to them, including London a couple of months ago. And I was envious <laughs> that they started 24-7 first because they have a huge problem with binge drinking, fighting, and the like. Where we're going to try 24-7 in Hawaii, hopefully, is with a felony violent population because alcohol is the biggest problem in the criminal justice system. And it's guys stabbing each other, fighting with each other, terroristic threatening, and alcohol is replete with that, especially with certain groups. And so that's what we're looking forward to. If people start small, they get their ducks in a row, we're convinced human nature is going to be you know, consistent, it's going to work. When I started this, people said, this is never going to work with people that have done prison time or a lot of jail time. They can do time standing on their head. And I said, yeah. They can when they have to, but human nature being what it is, they don't want to do it today. 
So I'd be willing to bet that human nature is more similar than dissimilar. And like I say, there are 18 states doing this now. In Indiana, it's called Hoosier Opportunity Probation and Enforcement. <laughs> this is possible. Where there's a will, there's a way. Let me, and let me just put an exclamation point on that. When I started, everybody thought I was crazy. Uh, the, the only thing I knew was that I'd done this before in Bennett County, 20 years before, and I knew that it worked. I grew up in that community, and I, I mean, I was putting my classmates from high school in custody. I knew these people when they were sober. And after 60 days of sobriety, you could tell by looking at them that they had quit drinking. I mean, their color changed. I mean, you know, if you've known, if you've known an alcoholic and you've seen them quit, uh, you can tell by looking at them that they have. Uh, and when I first launched this, uh, I literally begged and groveled. And I was the attorney general. Uh, you know, uh, but I had a couple old friends who were judges, one of whom was a recovering alcoholic, and uh, they did this for only one reason, and that was because I was the attorney general and they thought it was prudent to humor me for a few months. And then the thing would fall flat on its face, and then they would say, well, Larry, we, we gave it a try. But uh, that's the commitment that you have to make. Uh, the, you know, and you just have to find someone who is as committed as you are, and if you find that person, you can get it off the ground. Let me ask one more question before I turn it to the audience, and I'd like uh, Dr. DuPont if you could answer it first, but it's for the whole panel. What is the proper role for the federal government in this regard? <laughs> I think facilitating the spread of this idea, uh, and I think the federal government is already doing a lot and can do uh, much more. But I think there's also lots of room for the uh, uh, private sector, especially the philanthropic uh, uh, groups uh, like Pew has taken a terrific uh, lead in this. Uh, I, I, I have to mention I've been in this for a long time. Uh, right now is a remarkable moment in history. Uh, the, the, you notice when Paul introduced this uh, program today, he talked about the heritage program to reduce incarceration. Uh, this is part of that. Uh, very understandable. The country is coming together on that purpose, um, right and left and all across the political spectrum, in an exciting way. It's a great time to be interested in corrections. The same thing is happening with drugs. Uh, the drug issue is in the center of attention the way it has never been before, right now, and the prospects are more of that, I think. So I think there's opportunities now that are great. And I'm going to say one other thing before I let go of this, and that is that the issue about the substance abuse problem is lifelong. These programs are relatively short, even if it's four or five years. What happens to the people when they leave, when they're not being supervised? That is the big question to me. It's not whether while they're supervised they are better. They've shown that. That's dramatic, and most people didn't know that. But the big question is then what? And, and that's an open question, we'll see. But I'll tell you this in my time in the field, the thing that makes the difference in the stability of, of abstinence and stabilizing lives is what's called recovery, and it's the 12-step programs of Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous. Those are extremely important, and I would like to leave everybody with the un an understanding of how important that is in maintaining lifelong sobriety, because that is the big issue in the substance abuse field. Well, the federal government has been great already with this. It's um, in the bipartisan budget bill earlier this year, HOPE is part of that, at $4 million. The Justice Department is sponsoring replications, part of their demonstration field experiment, and Tom Foyt was instrumental in getting that done in Texas, Arkansas, Massachusetts, and Oregon. Uh, and just being a bully pulpit and talking about programs that work, helping, and part of that uh, budget money is going to set up a technical assistance crew to help out with that as well as starting some new sites. But when we try to get a site in a state to do it, I tell them, you have to be the emissaries for this. 
So Wendy Davis in Fort Wayne, Indiana, she's the one to train the other folks in Indiana. They'll believe her. Her POs can talk to POs there. Her law enforcement folks can talk to other law enforcement people. So the, gover the federal government can, can play a gro great role in many ways. They're doing it already. But the real growth is going to be in the states as they spread the word. Well, the, uh, the federal government certainly helped me get mine off the ground. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration uh, had more faith in me than the, than the judges that I was trying to uh, <laughs> convince uh, ought to do this. Uh, they, they, uh, they gave me a grant to uh, get my program off the ground in Minnehaha and Pennington counties, which were the two largest counties in South Dakota, because those sheriff's offices convinced themselves that they needed extra help in order to implement this, and I didn't have an appropriation. I didn't have any money. And so NHTSA uh, was very instrumental in, in my getting mine off the ground. Also, when we implemented the scram bracelets, uh, they bought 100 bracelets for me, and those are $1,400 a pop, and, and, uh, and they haven't asked for them back yet, and I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, uh, but they also, they also gave us a charge. We had to figure out how to pay for them ourselves, and, and that turned out to be a challenge that uh, worked to our benefit because we had to then deal with that. So uh, I, I certainly owe them a, uh, a, a large thank you, and, uh, uh, and, and I think they're helping me yet. Well, let me see if now if there are any questions from the audience. Let me just ask that you identify yourself and ask a question and get right to the point. The woman back there. Hi, um, hi Paul. Angeline Fraser with National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Uh, two quick questions. Um, one for Judge Alm. Um, can you talk a little bit, I, I think I may have missed it in the beginning, about um, the folks who actually are able to get into HOPE, are they, is everyone required to do drug testing, even if, the, if, even if drug and alcohol was not part of the initial offense. And second part is we've done a report on problem solving courts, specifically drug courts. And in our report, we found that a lot of drug courts around the country do the cherry picking, meaning that they pick the people who they know will get through through the system because they're low level folks who are really not users, they're sellers. And so this, the program is successful because of that, but the people who really need the treatment aren't getting that. And really quick for uh, Mr. DuPont, I'm of the belief that we cannot solve society's ills by putting people who are addicted to drugs because it is an illness in prison and people who have mental illness in prison. So I'd like you to just talk a little bit more about that and why you think having that as an option is a good thing considering people who do get in the system who have mental illness are not getting the treatment that they need. People who have addictions to alcohol and drugs are not getting the treatment that they need in prison because they cannot they can't do it. They don't have the capacity to do that. Thank okay. You. Well, first, the uh, I wrote an article for the Your Champion magazine a couple of years back, and our local Hactel Hawaii Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers wrote a supportive sidebar, as well as the Vice President of Drug Policy Alliance wrote a supportive sidebar. We don't add any conditions. So if somebody is put on probation it, in the pre-sentence report, if there's a connection, a nexus with drug and alcohol use, that's a condition of probation. That's the way we start. Probably 80, 85% of the cases in court have that. If so, they're going to get drug tested. If that's not, we don't add it. Uh, so they, they're not on the hotline, they're not doing it. It's whatever the conditions. If during the probationary period, the person shows up smelling of alcohol or there's some other nexus, then we'll add it. Uh, the second part uh, is for drug courts, Drug courts can be great, but as you talk about, often they're cherry-picked, they may be pretrial. prosecutors have a veto over who goes into it. Uh, we have shifted our drug court to be for the high-risk group. And so, uh, you know, in an article I wrote for the University of Oregon Law Review, and it's at that website, if you analogize a courthouse to a hospital, regular probation is the outpatient clinic, hope is all the wards, the drug court should be your ICU. So if people are failing at probation, they get put into hope. If they just can't stop using, in spite of going to a treatment program or two, that's who we're putting into our drug court because they are headed for prison. So drug court becomes kind of the last step on the continuum on the right-hand side. 
And you get a counselor, a case manager, wraparound services. The drug court's the best potential thing you have. You've got to focus on the right population for it. And that's, and that's what we're doing now. Four years ago, there were 52 people in our drug court. Now there are 200, including 50 with a dual diagnosis problem. I just, just one of the things in drug policy that drives me a little wild uh, is to think that the choice in drug policy <coughs> is treatment or prison. And so people are asked, which are you in favor of, treatment or prison, about drug policy? Uh, and I think that is a very false choice. Uh, people are in prison because of some criminal behavior that they've had. Many of them have mental illness that definitely contributes to their, uh, or substance abuse, contributes to criminal behavior, but they're there for the criminal behavior. They, to me, that's an opportunity for an intervention and help of those people. And what I would like to come out of this meeting and this concept is not to choose prison or treatment, but to say the goal is to make the two work together in a way that does better for those people than either alone. That's what this is about today. And I think to do it the other way, that they're somehow antithetical, I think, misses the opportunity that can come from the people who are already there. I'm not talking about putting somebody new in prison. I'm talking about they're already there. Let's find ways to use that. And the place to start is not the prison, per se, but it's the community corrections. And I think that this is a model that will work very well in the interests of people with substance use disorders and mental illness. Sir. I'm a Richard Kennedy, retired C analyst who got interested in drug policy about 43 years ago. <laughs> uh, and I don't think I've ever, ever heard a better presentation. Uh, nobody mentioned the name of Mark Kleiman from <laughs> UCLA, who uh, I believe was one of the original proponents of Project Hope. I know he wrote, wrote a book on this issue called When Brute Force Fails. Uh, just any comments about his contributions? He's our friend, all of us. Yeah, Absolutely. Right. He's here with us today. And we wouldn't be here without him. He, he is the one who's gotten everybody's attention. He got Paul interested in this field. So uh, uh, three cheers for Mark Kleiman and his role. <laughs> I, I had never heard of Mark Kleiman when this all this started. But about six months, eight months into it, we all started looking around the, you know, the country to see other people talking about this. So somebody from the Attorney General's office at our monthly meeting said, you've got to read what this guy's writing. Because I think he had a paper called Coerced Abstinence or something like that. And it sounded kind of sort of similar to what we were doing. So I called him up and I said, I'm this judge in Hawaii. He goes, well, that's interesting. Good. Give me a call at the end of the year. He remembers this conversation differently today than I do. <laughs> <laughs> but I called him up in December and I said, okay, we're up to 93 people. We got 80% fewer positive drug tests. He was thrilled because he had been talking about this for 20 years but couldn't get anybody to uh, pay attention. So he talked to the National Institute of Justice at the time, and at that time, uh, Jake Horowitz and Marlene Beckman, who worked there, came out to Hawaii to check it out. And M Mark has been responsible for much of the good press that has come around this. He knows more people in the press. You know, the Wall Street Journal did the first national story on it, and it's because he knew a reporter. Uh, Marlene Beckman came out, and I said, you're here to see that we're just not making these figures up in the office. She said, that's about it. So, so good for Mark. Yeah, let me second the kudos that you've already mentioned. I, I met him at a conference at Yale a few years ago, was intrigued by his work, read it, and uh, became persuaded because it sounded to me like it was an eminently sensible way to deal with these sorts of problems. Next question, John. Yeah, John. John Malcolm here at Heritage. Two quick questions. One, you talk about this being an expedited process. Do people who fail a drug test, hack or an alcohol test, have to appear in your court before they're revoked, or does it happen the moment the test comes back? And my second question, which is, did you face any resistance when you implemented these programs from prosecutors, probation officers, or the defense bar? Okay, well, first, if they, it's a $3.75 rapid drug screen cup. They piss into the cup if it, it's an instant response. If they deny it and they say, I don't know how that happened, it must be a mistake, we will seal the sample up, send it to a lab for a gas chromatograph test. They are not taken into custody. They're given a court date like 10 days later in my courtroom to show up. 
Therefore, if they come in, they're going to get 15 days if the lab confirms it because they're in their night or they're lying. So at the warning hearing, I'll tell them, if you ever mess up on Saturday night and your test is Monday, leave your car at home, don't bring your kids with you, come in, bite the bullet, and do the two or three days. Get, don't use, but if you do, think through your next steps. My challenge at the beginning, uh, I think probate, this is hard for judges because you got to... Uh, give a consequence every single time, but as short as possible to tie together the behavior with the consequence. It was just me, so that wasn't a problem at the beginning. That became a bigger problem when we went to all 10 felony judges. Probation officers lose discretion at the front end. This can be a challenge for them. Our probation folks at the beginning, a crisis can be an opportunity. They were willing to try something new. So if you and I both smoke meth and we go into the office and we admit it, we're both going to get arrested. Doesn't matter who we are, our race, our backgrounds, whatever, we're both. And, and that's why I think this program works. The offenders think they're being treated fairly. The law enforcement guys, because of my background, they were willing to serve more warrants. Once we got data showing fewer new arrests, fewer prison, they were sold on it at that point. But those are the three groups, judges, probation officers, and uh, law enforcement law enforcement that have to change. Prosecutors typically like it because now there's accountability and a consequence. Defense likes it because their clients don't go to prison as much. So that's been my experience. Yeah, I, I got some initial, I, I got some initial blowback from the prosecutors. They thought, well, we're gonna have all these probation hearings, you're gonna flood my courtroom. Of course, I was attorney general at the time and I just made a commitment. I'll send my people to take care of those hearings for you, but I promise you it's not gonna be an issue. Uh, and so that's how I dealt with it because I had, I had force in, in both the, the major communities. But uh, the, in the 24-7 in the aspect, because we're testing for alcohol, the typical holding period is only 24 hours anyway. Uh, and, and we've streamlined it to the point where in, in Minnehaha County at least, for the first violation, we hold them 12 hours and let them go and they never see a judge. I mean, they're just held 12 hours and then they're released. Uh, the second time, they're held 24 hours and then they're released. Now, the judges don't see anybody and they don't see the judge unless it's their third offense. And then something is probably going to happen because then they're getting into that aspect of the case where they're starting to be identified as somebody who can't quit uh, rather than who's choosing choosing to to like try to beat the rules any other questions sir yeah I'm uh, Richard Baum from the Office of National Drug Control Policy and this question is for uh, Judge Alm and Bob DuPont so now um, it's about to hit your first decade anniversary uh, 10 years uh, of hope if you take a step back and you look 10 years forward uh, how 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 much bigger and larger can this initiative spread around the country, thinking about the five million people in probation and parole, two million people in prison? Uh, if you look about, look, if you think about how many people you think would do well on this program, how how big would you like to go, and how do we how do you go forward in the next ten years in, in serving that need? Well, you get a good idea. Your foot should be on the accelerator. Right. So we've just, we're hopeful we'll start a pre-trial pilot soon. I think in 10 years, there's an even chance that this will be the way pre-trial probation and parole are done in most parts of the country. We need more data. We need more randomized control trial study. Some official Washington looks at Hawaii and thinks people sit under palm trees with Mai Tais and they're nice criminals. Uh, I had to overcome that when I was U.S. attorney. We got the same criminal problems everywhere else. But as this works in other places, it's not a Judge Alm thing. It's a human nature thing. So I really think with, you know, and the drug czar's office has been very helpful. Gil Kurlikowski has been a great uh, use of the bully pulpit to explore it, just like POS, just like NIJ, because people recognize it. But the more research you have, the better, and that's ongoing now. So I really think the, uh, as we show the, the savings in money, Washington State is showing huge dollar savings in not having people sit for three or four weeks before a hearing. As long as the crime rate doesn't go up, that is going to carry on. They've got 17,000 people in the program. So I am very optimistic about the future. Uh, and now with good data rolling in, I think it's just going to get better. 
I, I would like to pick up on this too about uh, Rich Baum in person, in particular, and his role in this at ONDCP. Uh, Hope uh, and 24 7 have been part of the fe U.S. federal strategy since 2010. Uh, and th th so the ONDCP role in this has been very, very important and it is uh, very much appreciated. I also want to follow up on the comment about doing this for everybody. You know, really the, the HOPE model uh, and the 24-7 uh, are not for the person who does something once, is a, a relatively minor offense, comes into probation or supervision, does well, goes out, and that's the end of it. Uh, it's for the people who have problems, who, are, who have repeat offenses, uh, who have not gotten that message, who have serious substance abuse problems. So it's not saying everybody in probation is going to do hope. It's saying hope is for the high-risk people. Hope is for the people who don't get it quickly. You notice that, for example, Steve Bond was talking, he's got 8,000 people in probation Hope is 2,000, and drug courts are 200. It's not everybody. It's, it's the, the tough end that we're talking about. That's where the recidivism is. That's where the, uh, uh, the uh, high costs are. That's where this value is. And I think that's really important to think it's not everybody who's in Hope who's on probation and parole. Well, and following up with that, Perito, what is it, Perito's... Uh Law, 20% of any group is responsible for 80% of the use or the product. So, and in probation and parole across the country, they probably are responsible for something like half of the hard drug use around the country. So we could have a real impact on the amount of use. This, if it went nationwide, could have a real impact on the narco uh, terrorist type uh, drug cartels in Mexico because we, our demand for it is fueling their activity. If there are no more que oh, if there are no more questions, let me just ask last one last one. <coughs> oh, there is. <coughs> oh, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm Jeff Michael with the National Hi National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. I want to thank you all three panelists for the very uh, informative presentation. Um, of, of course, from uh, my particular perspective, I'm, I'm interested in, particularly interested in, in that part of the substance abuse problem which takes place on our highways, um, which is an important one, but not the only one. Um, uh, we recognize the benefits of 24-7. We don't have many <coughs> programs that have that the potential that 24-7 has, um, and so we uh, are believers. We, of course, don't have authority to implement across the country. States and communities do that. Um, but we're trying to lead in, in this direction. The scalability issue is, is a big one for us. Um, uh, we really need to demonstrate to other communities that are larger, that handle greater volumes of serious offenders, um, that they can do it too. Um, can you say anything about uh, the you know, potential outside scale of such programs? Um, uh, could such programs handle um, uh, potentially hundreds of thousands of, of uh, offenders across the country? Well, I, Sioux Falls is the biggest community I've ever lived in for any length of time. <laughs> and, um, so uh, I, I start from there. Uh, the largest problem they have is parking, okay? If, you, if you're going to test more than 600 people at the same site, you need to have a big parking lot. That much I know, okay? <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I know there's a pilot going on in Des Moines, for example, which is a somewhat larger community. I've, I've understood that there's... Uh, going to be one going on somewhere in one of the communities in Florida, which I'm sure is larger than Des Moines. Uh, and uh, <coughs> I, I guess I have to go back. you got to pick a spot with a big parking lot, and you have to try it. Uh, but you can scale back the target audience. We scaled back. We started only with DUI, DUIs with a prior conviction. 
and we knew from the numbers in South Dakota how many people that was statewide. We also knew how many it was by county. So we knew the, at least when we started, the numbers were never going to get higher than that. Uh, now, of course, what turned out was that the judges immediately started seeing the efficacy of using it for situations other than drunk driving. The spouse abuse, I mean, there's a huge correlation between domestic abuse and alcohol abuse. And so the judges were using it there, too. And they were using it for burglaries and thefts and other alcohol-related misconduct. And, of course, it produces great benefits there as well. Uh, so, uh, and, of course, we, uh, I'm not telling stories out of the school, uh, NHTSA was not particularly happy with us for using their money to deal with spouse abuse and, <laughs> and burglars. But we worked that out. We, we all... We put all that together, but the bottom line is you got to pick a spot and try it. And uh, and if you want me to to fly to Florida and speak, I'll I'll be doing that. <laughs> Let me thank each of the panel members. It was a true privilege for me to sit here with people who've had such distinguished careers and who have devoted such a large part of their careers to coming up with an innovative way of addressing the problems of morbidity and mortality on our highways and in our communities. Please join me in thanking them for coming here to give us the benefit of their time. And I thank Paul Larkin and Heritage for making this happen. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>